Thank you. We will move to, immediately to general questions. And question number one, Emma Harper. Thank you, President. Ask the Scottish Government what type of digital mapping systems it uses for making and assessing rural payments. Cabinet Secretary Fergus Ewing. Our Rural Payments and Inspection Division use a digital mapping system known as the Land Parcel Identification System to support the validation of common agricultural policy payments, including the Basic Payment Scheme. Emma Harper. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. Is there more that can be done to ensure that the mapping system is as accurate as it can be? For example, is the Scottish Government, make, government making the most of available technology with its mapping system? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I, yes, I, I believe we are, is the answer to that. And we are using a GIS system supplied by ESRI, one of the largest suppliers of uh, GIS in the world. And our mapping is updated regularly using the Orton Survey master map data, uh, along with uh, aerial photography, sp specifically commissioned by ARPID for updating our land parcel identification system. And I'm happy to arrange for ARPID staff to brief the member to provide further information. Peter Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the Minister will be aware of the importance of getting the, the, the mapping system right in order to meet European Commission regulations regarding the CAP payments. The Audit Scotland report in May raised serious concerns over the ability of the IT system to minimise disallowance. Can he confirm that the mapping system is sufficiently accurate and up to date that the Scottish Government will not have to pay disallowances of up to £25 million? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I don't believe the Audit Scotland report really criticised the, the mapping system per se, uh, but I was encouraged, as I'm sure the member will have been, by the very positive reaction to the announcement I made uh, in the parliamentary statement that uh, to deal with the difficulties, we are bringing forward a national loan scheme of up to £300 million, which will be injected into the rural economy in uh, November. And I was delighted to see that Finlay Carson recognised, along with the NFU, that this will provide certainty and clarity to rural communities in the winter months. Rhoda Grant. Officer. Cabinet Secretary will be aware that as far as crofting is concerned, there are a number of mapping systems. Um, there are the Register of Scotland maps that are being set up. The Crofting Commission has maps of crofts, and indeed um, the cap payment claim forms have maps of crofts. Is this causing any confusion when it comes to the mapping system with the cap payments? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I suppose it's fair to say that the crofting legislation uh, co confusion is not entirely absent. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, uh, I don't think that the mapping system contributes to that confusion. But uh, if the member wants to write to me about any particular concerns that she may have, then of course I'd be happy to consider them further. Question number two, David Torrance. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it encourages investment in and development of energy storage systems across Scotland and how it intends to further support these initiatives throughout the session of Parliament. I'm not entirely sure, Mr Torrance, that was the question that I had in your order paper. Yes. Can you answer that question, though, uh, Minister Paul Wheelhouse? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's certainly energy storage, uh, uh, presiding officer, is, is all scales can play a crucial, crucial role in Scotland's low-carbon energy system. And Scotland's existing pumped hydro storage assets often uh, offer a proven means of large-scale energy storage. We are working with industry to outline many benefits of the technology and to make the case to UK government to support new capacity. Uh, we do have um, local energy challenge funders supporting the demonstration of innovative energy storage technologies. For example, we provided £3.2 million to the East Heat project to support the deployment in homes across the Lothians and Falkirk of the thermal storage battery developed by the Scottish company Sunamp. Uh, the Leavenmouth Community Energy Project has received £4.3 million to build on the hydrogen production and storage facilities at Methyl, which includes providing low carbon fuel for five uh, council vehicles. And the Surf and Turf Project in Orkney has received £1.175 million and will produce hydrogen from both onshore wind and marine energy, which will be stored, transported and converted back into electricity for use in buildings and berth ferries at Kirkwall Harbour. Uh, further support for development and deployment of energy storage will be considered as part of the Scottish Government's new energy strategy, a draft version of which is due to be published around the end of the year, and we uh, continue to work on storage solutions and grid connections to those storage solutions. David Torrance. I thank the Minister for her an answer. An energy storage proposal is moving forward in Kirkcaud area after developers identified spare capacity at a local substation and appropriate land nearby. In order to attract similar investment across Scotland, 
What steps are the Scottish Government taking to overcome higher transmission charges for Scottish grid connections? Minister. Um, well, certainly the, the member highlights an issue which is of great concern to the Scottish Government. We've been calling for a change to the transmission charging regime for years. We welcome the partial improvements that have been implemented through Project Transmit. But as we made clear earlier this year, when we saw the closure of Longanet Power Station, there is still a long way to go until there is a fair system that doesn't discriminate against Scotland and puts much needed uh, power supplies in question. Scottish ministers meet regularly with both uh, Ofgem and National Grid and continue to encourage them to ensure that the transmission charging regime stops penalising Scottish generation. I am aware of a project in uh, Mr Torrance's constituency led by AES, UK and Ireland, and uh, we have been in regular dialogue with that developer as recently as 19th of August to hear about their grid-scale uh, lithium-ion battery technology and we'll look forward to trying to help that company overcome any barriers. Alexander Burnett. Uh, thank you. Could the Minister elaborate on the potential that the Scottish Government sees in liquid air storage technology uh, to reduce our reliance on imported gas for heating? Minister. Well, certainly the, the member highlights an important area in our draft energy strategy, which will be hopefully published around the end of the year. We'll be looking to try and tackle the overwhelming problem we have of 54% correct, correct myself, of uh, Scotland's energy consumption being required to provide heat, mainly for space heating purposes. So clearly we are looking at alternative technologies uh, to support the ongoing supply of heat to our communities, tackle fuel poverty and do so in a, an affordable way. But uh, there are exciting projects, including uh, looking at exploring hydrogen and other uh, technologies to do that. Question number three, Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how much paying at least a living wage to social care workers from October 2016 will cost health and social care partnerships. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robinson. We have made national estimates on the cost of increasing wages to the living wage level. This analysis has been placed in the Parliament's Reference Centre, Bib number 57809. Whilst we have estimated at a national level the investment required to meet the living wage, circumstances will vary across authorities in Scotland, for example, in the volume and balance of contracted out care and the progress some councils and providers have already made towards payment of the living wage. Health and social care partnerships are working closely with providers to assess the cost of implementation in their area and to determine, negotiate and agree the appropriate approach. No. Colin thank, Smith. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for, for that answer. But, but will the Cabinet Secretary accept that the, the national estimate she refers to has proved to be wholly inadequate? And will the Scottish Government agree to review that estimate for the forthcoming year, starting by simply asking integrated joint boards what the actual costs have been? And will the Minister put in place a proper long-term framework that ensures future funding takes account of the actual costs in each area, increases as the living wage increases, and delivers a whole strategy that takes account not only of the living wage, but training and career progression. Cabinet Secretary. Well, the Scottish Government has provided uh, significant investment to meet this commitment. £125 million has been made available to partnerships to enable the living wage to be paid to care workers supporting adults and to help meet a range of existing costs faced by local authorities in the delivery of effective and high quality services. Um, I am absolutely confident of this being delivered from the 1st of October. I would hope that would be something the opposition benches would welcome. And of course, as we take this forward in discussions with COSLA and the sector as part of the spending review going forward, uh, we will be uh, ensuring the sustainability of the delivery of the living wage. Question number four, Tavish Scott. To ask the Scottish Government for changes to the structure of NHS boards will have on the recruitment of GPs. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robertson. Uh, we're transforming our primary care services and we're working with all health boards and key stakeholders to support GP recruitment and retention. This includes investing over £2 million in a GP recruitment and retention fund, increasing our GP training places as well as creating a £20 million support package for GP practices. As was set out in the programme for government, we will begin work in this parliament to examine the number, structure and regulation of health boards as well as their relationship with local authorities. In taking this review forward, I want to reduce bureaucracy and remove any barriers to effective patient care. The review will, of course, take account of forthcoming proposals for an islands bill, which will include a commitment to island-proof future government legislation and policies. Tavish Scott. I'm grateful for that answer. Does that mean that uh, she will not sweep away NHS uh, Shetland uh, and will she ensure that uh, the future of the NHS uh, will be about the recruitment of the GPs that are badly needed not just in Shetland but in many other parts of Scotland as well? 
Cabinet Secretary. Well, can I say to Tavish Scott that in, in his letter he said, while we support the principle of a review of health boards on the basis of improving patient care, it cannot lead to a solution which centralises health services away from the islands. Well, as Tavish Scott knows, uh, of course, most services are now, uh, health services, primary and community health services, are now under the auspices of, of the world of integration through our IJBs. And of course, many acute services to the islands are already provided by uh, other uh, territorial boards um, uh, to the, the island uh, communities. So what I can say to Tavish and give him this guarantee is that absolutely any review of health boards uh, and changes to health boards will be on the basis of improving patient care. That will be the starting point for the review and no other considerations. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Before we move on to the next item of business, Members will wish to join me in welcoming to the gallery Mr Robert Newton, Speaker of the Northern Ireland Assembly. And members, one second. And members will also wish to join me in welcoming His Excellency Dr Rizal Sukma, Ambassador of the Republic of Indonesia to the United Kingdom. Point of order, Mr Kelly. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I'm aware that general questions didn't start until 10 minutes later than planned uh, due to unforeseen uh, circumstances. Can I just ask your guidance, Presiding Officer, if there's any provision under standing orders to allow for an additional 10 minutes here just now or at the end of business to allow members to raise the issues that they had uh, on the, the agenda? Can I thank Mr Kelly for raising that point? Um, I intend to have discussions with Mr Kelly as the business manager and the other business managers about whether uh, members wish uh, for the extra 10 minutes back and when that would be arranged. So we'll arrange that discussion after First Minister's questions.